All right, welcome everybody. Uh, the Office of Programs to Enhance the Neuroscience Workforce, or OPEN at NINDS, is very excited and pleased to welcome you to the second annual Life Trajectories uh, with the Hispanic or Latin Latinx Ambassadors and Allies to NINDS, or affectionately called OLA NINDS. Um, we are sharing several stories from our panelists today. Um, before we get started, I just have a few meeting reminders. Uh, one is that this is a webinar, so all of the attendees are muted. Uh, you won't be able to raise your hand or show your camera, but we do highly encourage interaction. So feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A box at any time throughout the webinar. We'll have a Q&A section at the end. And if you want to make any comments or uh, uh, celebratory notes, uh, feel free to use the chat for that. <laughs> uh, again, the presentation is being recorded. Um, we are going to share the recording and the slides and any resources shared during today's presentation in an email afterwards. Um, so you can share it with your colleagues that missed this or uh, just rewatch it later. We also have uh, a wonderful captioner with us. And so you can uh, check out those captions uh, under the transcript at the bottom of your screen. We hope you stay connected with us um, as we do these, these webinars about once, once a month. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Dr. Alva Resina. Thank you, Ana. Um, so, bienvenido, bienvenidos a todos. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Alva Resinos, and I'm a foreign medical graduate currently working as a health program specialist at NINDS. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the music um, while you all were waiting. For those of you who attended last year, you already know this, um, but for the first timers, um, you were listening to an instrumental version of a very popular song called Los Caminos de la Vida, um, which is where we got our inspiration for the title of the uh, webinar, um, with a very real message about the paths of life not always being what you expected as a kid um, and working through the scenic paths of life. Um, so we wanted to drive that message home. Um, so to close out our Hispanic Heritage Month, um, we tech technically ended yesterday, but we're going to act like today is the 15th. Um, the Hispanic or Latin Latinx ambassadors and allies to NINDS, Hola NINDS, uh, employee resource group welcomes you to Los Caminos de la Vida or Pathways to Life or Pathways to NIH, um, a panel discussion highlighting the diverse and often unexpected paths that have led our panelists to their current roles at NIH and or NIH funding opportunities. NIH is a place where science thrives, dreams and aspirations are realized and care careers are nurtured. As we navigate this discussion, our panelists will explore their narratives deeply, sharing their origins and the pivotal moments that shape their journeys to NIH. They will offer us a glimpse into their daily roles, showcasing the breadth and depth of opportunities available as well as share valuable resources that can guide aspiring professionals uh, to carve out their pathways to an NIH. Whether you're a student, a young professional, or someone just considering a career pivot, we invite you to listen actively, engage with our panelists, um, for today could be a discussion that could um, be the starting, point, the starting point of your pathway to NIH. So without further ado, let's begin our journey through Los Caminos de la Vida, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelist. Our first speaker is from the country that took the World Cup in 2022 and blessed us with Leo Messi. Um, she works on main campus and is part of intramural, intramural, working in the office of the scientific director and an executive board member of OLA NINDS. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Silvina Horovitz. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Hola a todos. Uh, en los próximos minutos les, les uh, voy a contar un poquito de, I'm sorry, switching to English. In, in the next uh, few minutes, I will tell you a little bit about uh, my journey uh, to here. As Alba said, I am from Buenos Aires, uh, that besides um, being uh, the capital is a big city. We are 3 million people in the city and the metropolitan area is about uh, 13 million, almost a third of the country. Um, so 
uh, I went to elementary school and high school, both in the city. I have to show this picture with jacarandas because it's a time of the year that are flowering and giving this beautiful color to our city. And most people in Buenos Aires stay there because it's a big metropolis. However, when I finished um, high school, I was interested both in uh, medicine and in engineering. So um, the, the path that I chose was biomedical engineering or bioengineering. And of course, was the only career that was offered in Argentina at the time, a new school, but was not in Buenos Aires. So my first uh, Camino, my first path starts going from to Oro Verde in the province of Entre Rios, where I uh, studied biomedical engineering. Uh, it was kind of a new thing. We were, uh, by the time we finished, the first uh, graduate group of bioengineers uh, for the, from the country. And uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, I did work on functional electrical simulation at the time. Uh, mainly focusing on uh, rehabilitation engineering and also medical instrumentation. At the time uh, that I graduate uh, in Argentina, engineering is uh, six years. So it's like equivalent to a master's. I work in a rehabilitation hospital in Santa Fe that is kind of across the river. Um, I mean, I to mention, I did another short trip to Tucumán that is in the northwest of the country where I did an internship through my uh, school. And also I worked in the equivalent of the FDA, uh, but mainly through the rehabilitation engineer. And I think that's what shows uh, I'm kind of start building my path. Um, I started seeing differences in the rehab of the patient. This was observational only, but uh, kind of put in question on me about whether blame plasticity um, was a result of this electrical stimulation. And uh, this is in the early 90s, uh, that tells my age, and um, an fMRI and MRI uh, was something new. I had the chance to do a course in Buenos Aires. Uh, I learned a little bit about MRI. So um, I came to the US the first time uh, to uh, New Haven, Connecticut at Yale to visit Dr. Panjabi's uh, rehabilitation lab. And uh, I, because my interest in learning about um, the, the possibilities to see uh, if MR, fMRI will tell us something about rehabilitation, I set up a meeting with Dr. John Gore, uh, who was the director of the MRI research program. And uh, just uh, literally the day before, at the time, uh, he had gotten a grant uh, from the Whitaker Foundation to set up the biomedical engineering program. So even though we set the meeting to talk about uh, MRI and rehabilitation and the brain, uh, we end up talking about how I can contribute to their bio new biomedical engineering program, given that I just came from a school that was a new program, biomedical engineering, and uh, was also helping on the teaching. So it turns out to be um, a great fit. And um, I came first uh, to the US uh, as a lecturer. They gave me a um, position as a lecturer and I work on co helping coordinate in the program and do some teaching. And uh, two years later, I figured if I wanted to continue doing uh, research, uh, I needed to do a PhD. And I joined the Engineering Applied Science program. Uh, and John was, John was my advisor. And uh, funny enough, uh, the Biomedical Engineering program was approved and accepted as uh, one of the Yale programs that laid out after my graduation. Um, so during the time, I realized that um, I have the I didn't speak much English when I came to the US, but I have study and I have a, a degree and I have possibilities that I see others didn't. So uh, during my time there uh, through working and uh, being a student, I always volunteer as interpreter uh, at the hospital that was where I have my office. Um, in that time, I work, as I said, on uh, MRI and brain imaging. So I, I start working on methods uh, integrate data, multimodal imaging, and uh, see looking at different ways that uh, we can study the brain, but also involving a lot of different techniques and technology and see how we can look for better methods and advantages for that. So that take me to, to my next step and uh, get into NIH. And um, 
So from Yale, I have a little stop at Vanderbilt because my whole lab moved uh, as I was finishing my PhD. So it was only temporary because at the time I already have um, decided to come to NIH. And I think there was a question in the QA about how someone find a postdoc position that that was my first position here at NIH. And the way that I found it was in a bulletin board at one of the conferences. That's a good place to find what is available or looking into the labs of uh, what um, that, that you could be a fit. Uh, that's where we typically publish uh, these type of positions. Um, so at the time, the lab was interested in looking at EEG fMRI, and uh, that was my background. So uh, it took a while to, to get all the paperwork set, but I come first uh, with my optional practical, uh, practical training. That is um, a visa that allows you to work when you're a foreigner and then switch to be an NIH employee um, soon after. Um, so when my postdoc finished was what is my next uh, step? And uh, I was interested in, as I say, working with medicine and, and learning the, about the brain and learning the technologies. So I wanted to move uh, more to a clinical, uh, something that we can do from technology that helps people. So um, through also networking and communications uh, with others, uh, I, I heard from a colleague that uh, the human motor control section was looking for a staff scientist. Uh, that's um, a position within the intramural uh, program. And I applied for that, compete for that interview and so forth, and uh, end up getting this position where I worked uh, for 15 years or so with uh, in collaborations with neurologists. Uh, to study the basis of uh, the study of a biological basis of movement disorders, uh, different diseases. And during the time, I have uh, the privilege to mentor many clinical fellows, uh, postdocs, and also a lot of summer students. And um, one of the things that I always uh, mention to, to them, that one of the most important things to, to get ahead and to, to move in a field is the networking, how you connect with others, let others know uh, what you do and what is that you want. Uh, and, I, and if you're in a position to help, help others and promote others. So uh, during that time, I expand my fMRI and EEG to a lot of other modalities in, um, in brain studies, of physiology, genetics, uh, clinical information, just mainly in general, if you have a question and we want an answer, just getting all the methods possible and uh, find a path where we can, um, we can get a path to our response. But uh, let me go back one more. So, sorry, this moved too fast. So the, um, this also, uh, got to an end by uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, so it was a question of next step. At this point, it was a little harder. I'm more senior, have more experience, and then the, the pyramid gets smaller. And, and again, talking to people is how I got to, to my current position. Um, I should say that about uh, the same time of this is one, uh, or a little bit before, probably I joined the board of Ola. I have been in the board for uh, about two years, and Ola um, is um, it's also a good way, uh, has been a good way to network and, and talk to people and get to know people uh, within the institute. Uh, but yeah, so my next step was um, working on this mobile, cal clin uh, mobile clinical research unit initiative. And I got to this talking to uh, Rita Devine that she's a person who I used to work for many years into uh, trying to find um, places and help the summer students, especially from uh, minority groups. And uh, so, sorry, I have an alarm in the, in the background. Uh, so uh, for minority groups, and uh, so she knows my interest in reaching out to populations. And uh, so when she she put forward the possibility of working on this was very exciting for me to create a resource to tackling health disparities in the neurological research. So we have now these uh, portable MRI and uh, our idea is to be able to put these in a track and uh, take NIH research to where people are, because we know that both uh, who are uh, the researchers 
uh, determine how people participate. We want to have uh, diversity in the researchers, but also diversity in the population coming uh, to us. So, so this is an ongoing project uh, that I'm very excited about. Um, and I, I want to stress again uh, the importance of networking. So we are trying to network in this uh, position with faculty and, and the community within NIH, with communities outside NIH, uh, and that's what would potentially make this, uh, this project um, possible. And with this, I should say also, I am uh, the vice chair of the Staff Scientists uh, and Clinicians Association. That's a group of, um, it's another group here at NIH that tried to get people in uh, these positions of uh, staff scientists that is uh, an intramural, and staff clinicians that are uh, intramural position that doesn't exist outside. And the idea is to help each other understand the positions, get tools, get everybody to progress, but also the idea to uh, external people that want to come to NIH, have a group of people that are in those positions and they can find and find what we do. So to conclude, um, I want to uh, show here some of the resources on how to find for positions here. Um, because these are links, I'm putting here the link to uh, to my lab, where uh, they will be at the end of join us part, uh, how to get these, and there are different opportunities for people to join NIH, uh, the intramural, of course, summer program is a short version that people can come and is for post -backs in general, but some people in grad students as well uh, come in. Um, the postback position that people coming here after finishing their college in, in the transitions years towards uh, grad school or professional schools and stay with us for a year or two. It's a competitive program, but uh, there is applications typically coming in December and uh, the process goes through through the first uh, years of the winter and we make decisions and people come when they finish uh, college. Uh, the graduate medical education and NIH also have all the programs that uh, clinicians uh, can uh, come to do. In particular, I am the director of the Clinical Neuroimaging Fellowship, so the link is here. And um, with this, I will pass it to, to the next and I will be happy to um, answer questions. Here's my contact information and the email for the all executive board. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silvina. Um, okay, so our next speaker um, has a passion for a sport that is by far the best of all time. Um, totally biased, um, and I'm sure not many will agree, but um, again, I'm biased, um, and I'm talking about softball. Um, she's also a part of Intramural and works with the Office of the Scientific Director. It's my pleasure to introduce Monica Gonzalez. Thank you so much, Alva. Uh, yes, that is my passion as well. And uh, yes, I do like my softball. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you to, for, for all of you to invite me to this presentation. Um, I'm quite honored and um, don't have quite the fancy experience and all that, but uh, I do have a passion for, for a lot of things. And, and one is for NIH. Um, I started my journey. I was born in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, the land of enchantment. Um, moved here when I was two years old um, because my dad uh, became a director of one of the um, programs here at the National Institutes of Health, but we'll get to that later. Um, I do like to revisit my, my home state. Um, we don't need a passport to get there, um, but uh, it is fun to go back and visit my family and, and see their farm and, and enjoy time with them. Um, I did graduate uh, in the Maryland area, and I earned an academic and athletic scholarship to play at New Mexico State University. So I did have the uh, pleasure of being on a, a Division I softball team, so it was a, a pretty fantastic experience. Um, my, my time I learned um, with my dad at NIH, um, he introduced me to a lot of people and exposed me to uh, some different sciences. And I really was fascinated with biomedical engineering. So it was kind of cool to see Sylvania say that she had a degree in biomedical engineering. Um, at the time when I went to school, they didn't have a degree in biomedical engineering. So they, they said, hey, why don't you go into chemical engineering and then you can make that transition as a master's in biomedical engineering. So I took that role on. Um, as you can imagine, playing a Division I sport and taking on an engineering degree, it became very challenging. 
Um, but I did find myself in a situation where I'm like, do I really like chemical engineering? And um, I realized maybe that wasn't it. So after talking with my uh, advisors, they suggested, hey, well, your interest is biomedical. So why don't you start taking your biology classes? And at that point I did and absolutely loved it. Um, and I made a really good connection with my professor and she offered me a position to come work in her lab um, doing research on frog brains of all things. And uh, I did that for credit um, and I just fell in love with that. And I knew that's probably the right direction I needed to go. Um, and doing that, I changed my um, college. So I ended up going to the University of Maryland and changing my degree. Uh, to microbiology. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to play softball at Maryland because I didn't have a team there. So I had to give that up, but I did not give up playing. Um, so what I did was I joined a lot of things uh, and a lot of um, clubs, but one of the things that helped me the most was SOCNUS. And if you don't know it, um, many of you do and may, may, ha may have helped you. Um, it's the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And going back to my dad, I'm so proud that, to be the daughter of one of the founders of SOCNUS. Um, he, he brought a lot of good to a lot of people. And my parents, when they moved to Maryland, um, they wanted to prevent us from being discriminated against because when they grew up, they suffered um, terrible bullying, terrible discrimination because of their accent, where they were from. And it saddens me to think that that was the case because when we moved here, they chose not to speak Spanish to us and I never learned the language. And of course now everybody around here seems to know Spanish and I wish I did. And I wish I could have been able to do that with them. But I am thankful for the opportunity my dad gave us and he wanted to support minorities and support all types of minorities. So one of the programs he was um, part of was not only SACNAS, but he was a director of the MBRS program which is the Minority Biomedical Research Support Program. Um, totally amazing uh, program. And to watch all the people that he helped over the years um, to bring more um, minorities into science and medicine, um, it, it's been fascinating. And I've met so many of these people as I've spent, this is my 30th year at NIH. Um, so really, really fun to watch and meet all these people. Um, so that was a great resource. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join that program, but it, I, I didn't really need it because I was introduced to so many people. Um, while I was at the University of Maryland, I also made myself, um, I hadn't made it be seen, right? So um, going to a large university, some of you may have, um, you kind of get lost in the numbers. You know, some of my classes were over 200. So how do you, how do you make yourself stand out and uh, fit in and, and, and reach out to, to, to the professors. So I started the American Society of Microbiology chapter at the University of Maryland. And that was such a huge um, resource for me because I met so many of the professors. Um, I met so many of the students there and we, we connected. Um, and later I met a lot of them um, back at uh, NIH. So that was really good connection for me. Another resource that I really highly encourage, if you haven't done this, is go to a LULAC convention, the League of Latin American Citizens. What a great resource. So many people there that go um, have SES um, experience. They've worked in so many different parts of the government. Um, and that's where I learned how to really format my resume and uh, make it applicable to a federal um, job. So that was pretty exciting um, to learn all that and meet those people. So definitely look into that. Um, so once I had all these resources and I had this plan, um, as I told you, my dad worked at NIH. He was also a big fan of uh, sailing. So he joined the NIH Sailing Club. Um, and so there's so many clubs on campus, uh, and I, I highly encourage you to join some. Uh, I'm part of the NIH Pickleball Club, the NIH Softball Club. I, I, I ran that for a little bit, uh, one of the teams. For, and um, it helped me uh, meet Larry Ray, who used to be the executive officer for the National Cancer Institute. So my dad met him sailing. And so I went sailing with him and Larry. And Larry's like, well, why don't you come work at NIH? I said, I don't know. And he's like, well, send me your resume. So I sent him my resume and I ended up um, getting to work in the wonderful lab of Stephen, Dr. Steven Rosenberg over in the surgery branch for the National Cancer Institute. It was a great opportunity for me 
um, I met this <laughs> amazing group of people down here. Um, and many of them have gone on and uh, are doing uh, research at other institutions and companies. And so I was just uh, really fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, we, we studied tumor immunology. We developed tumor vaccines using our, uh, our own body's immune system to fight them off. I'm sure you guys have heard about it in the news, the CAR T cells, um, really fascinating work. So um, I spent 12 years, 12 years with Dr. Rosenberg, another five with other NCI labs. Um, and one of the things that I learned was, you know, when, when you're in a building and you have a, a lab that's growing, you need space. And um, sometimes we got moved to new space and it wasn't exactly the best move or the best space for what we were doing. So a situation arose where my lab that I was working in, uh, was having to move to Frederick. And in moving there, uh, I ran into a guy that I used to play NIH softball with. And I told him I wasn't really fond of moving to uh, Frederick and I wasn't really interested in being in the lab anymore. So he said, why don't you come detail with me? So we spent time uh, discussing this and I ended up working in his office, um, helping NCI uh, with space and move management. Um, I worked there for five years and then got recruited to the NIH's Office of Research Facilities and supported the uh, administrative leases for all of NIH uh, on and off campus. Um, and doing that, I met a, a many uh, executive officers for the institutes and, and other directors that um, help manage their programs. And uh, I was introduced to someone in the office of uh, the scientific director for NINS, and they asked me if I would come work with them. And I applied and got the position as the NINS space and renovations manager. So I'm so happy to have had this opportunity to come to NINDS. So what do I do? So I manage all the space and renovation for NINS. I relay the needs of the scientists to the office of the scientific director. I maintain all the floor plans for the NINS space, participate in the trade negotiations because space is such a necessary commodity on campus as many of you know that work here. Um, so having those uh, important discussions with other ICs is, is, is good. Um, I oversee all the NINS renovation projects, as there's many. You see lots of uh, <laughs> renovations going on on campus. So you can imagine uh, the time and uh, effort that takes. And uh, I help with any facility issues by communicating with the ORF staff and contractors performing any of the building related work. So I'm happy to be here and uh, help the, my fellow scientists um, get the space and, and, and that they need to, to perform their work. And, and you'll see the amazing work that many of these scientists do. Um, I'm gonna leave you with lessons I've learned. Um, never quit, always challenge yourself to learn more because there's so much out there to learn. It's, I'm constantly learning every day. Make connections whenever you can. Like I said, the NIH uh, clubs, um, there's so many resources, SACNAS. I don't know if the Minority Biomedical Research Program is out there for those of you that are still in school. Um, just take advantage of that. Don't be afraid to change your career path. You never know where it could lead. Um, try out a detail, which is what I did. Experience something new. You might, might find uh, your niche there. And then take advantage of the free low cost courses and speakers that NIH offers if you are at NIH. Um, I know many of the schools offer them too. Um, but they're, they're out there, the resources that you don't have to pay a lot of money, if, if at all. And of course, as a community, we want to support each other. So um, be willing to support others in their journey. And thank you all so much for allowing me to be here and present to you. Thank you so much, Monica. Our next speaker is one of my colleagues. He has a great sense of humor, uh, which I'm certain will come through during his presentation and is also an OLA member who helped organize the Hispanic Heritage Month NIH Neuro Symposium uh, that took place uh, on main campus last month. So maybe some of y'all got to meet him in person. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Claudio Villalobos Lintrans. Gracias, Alba, por la presentación y eh, muy contento de poder contar mi experiencia. Um, yeah, so, um, my journey as the journey of many of our colleagues might not be a straight line and is full of stories and 
terms and new experience. Um, I was born in a small town in the mountains of Chile. Um, the name of the town was Coya, as you can see here. Uh, it's right in the middle of the mountains. It's beautiful. Um, if you ever get to go to Chile, please go. Um, but um, that it marks a little bit of my life experience where I was born in a very small town. And as I start traveling and working in different places, start meeting more people, being involved in um, living in big cities and um, ended up in, in NDS. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my, my pathways. One of the main things that it struck me when I moved to the U.S. was that even though we do have a better affinity with a lot of Latinos, not all Latinos are considered or there are consider the cells they look the same or they have the same traditions. Um, as um, part of Chilean's community, um, one of the things that I was very uh, interested in was that I was very uh, often confused as Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, or, uh, Dominicans, whatever um, bigger group of Latinos are in the city that I was living on. So uh, part of my experience was trying to tell them like, well, we're different. There are different types of Latinos. There are different types of Hispanics all over the all over the South America, especially. Um, and one of the things that I, would, uh, I gathered data from my country just to demonstrate that even though we do have more common Latinos, we're not all the same. Um, for example, we even though we all speak Spanish, our if you have met any other Latinos, we know that our Spanish is very particular um, to the point that it becomes almost hard to understand um, and almost another language. Um, another point is that despite our name and the look of our country, we do not eat a lot of spicy food. Um, I have developed that palate, and I really like spicy food, but growing up, we just don't do it. Um, it's not very common. And third, we just not good at dancing. We have some rhythm if you compare us with some other people, especially from the North Hemisphere. But um, yeah, we not we're not very good compared to uh, Cuban Dominicans people who have this inner rhythm in the blood. Um, so um, this data tells like even though we are very similar, we have similar traits, we like to, you know, bond to each other. Um, not all Latinos are clustered and they, they are um part of the same the same group. We are we all each have our own differences, and that's what it makes us all particularly, that's what it makes us a strong and very thriving group. Um, so as part of my my career, I I moved from these small towns. Um, into the capital where I went to uh, undergrad, where um, I studied both licenciatura en ciencia biológica, so like biology, and also I was uh, doing med school. Um, and after several years, I decided to stick with research. Um, and started my career in uh, researching um, uh, the effect of psychotropic drugs in receptors expresses in, in um, Sinopus levis all sites. Um, and what it, it was a pure pharmacology, pharmacological uh, project. Um, after this, I wanted to um, um, expand my knowledge and the techniques, because even though this technique was very useful for pharmacology, it was not um, apply, very applicable to brains, that it is essentially I was dedicated to, uh, I wanted to become a, a neuroscientist. So in one meeting, I met a professor who um, invited me to work in his lab. So I packed my bags and I moved to Detroit where I would start, uh, Detroit, Michigan, where I started working in his lab and eventually ended up going to um, um, grad school where I, I got my, my PhD. In there, uh, um, so Wayne State University in Detroit, um, I worked in the lab first, and then I went to grad school and I got my PhD in uh, pharmacology, working essentially in um, um, investigating the intracellular mechanisms of, of several uh, cars that they uh, control um, neuronal excitability. Um, after done with my PhD, um, I decided to come back to Chile, and that's where I did my first postdoc. Um, how did I get this postdoc position? Um, I literally knocked on the door of several professors until one of them um, decided to take an opportunity on me, and um, I took a, a, a different uh, 
subject, and now I was studying um, memory consolidation in special memory patient memory consolidation in, in rats using now not intracellular recordings but using extracellular recordings. So recording the electrical activity of multiple neurons in uh, freely moving animals and it's trying to figure out how the activity of these neurons contribute to the uh, consolidation of, of, of memories. Um, while I was doing my postdoc, I won a couple of grants. Um, I thought my career was in a, in a good path to become a you know, um, researcher, established researcher, uh, principal investigator. Um, but again, you know, la vuelta de la vida, something happens and you have to turn uh, and change plans. In my case, um, this is where I met my wife, who was uh, an American citizen, and we decided to start our life back in the States. So back my bags again, uh, and moved to the state again, and I um, laid up uh, another uh, postdoctoral or um, research associate and then assistant professor, uh, project scientist position at UCLA, where I combine a lot of the um, techniques and um, knowledge that I acquired through all my scientific career and developed this project working on um, control of oriented movements. Um, um, after this, um, I was um, I had the the idea of also becoming a PI in the in the in the US, but um, it's become harder when you come first of all from another country. Also, when you have spent a lot of years um, traveling and changing subjects, so um, I make another turn in my career and I. Um, took a position of adjunct instructor in biology and Nebraska Wesleyan University in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, where I was teaching um, anatomy and physiology. This gave me a little opportunity to um, um, develop another set of skills. This uh, teaching, organizing course, uh, um, mentoring students, which is something that, you know, as a researcher, we don't you, we don't usually get the opportunity to um, to experience. And after that, um, I took another turn and I decided to, you know, try like what all my skills could be useful now in an industry. So I, I apply and I took a job uh, uh, at Thermo Fisher, uh, who recently acquired PPD, which is a um, and another company as an associate group leader, uh, where um, I was overseeing a group of uh, analysts doing um, essentially immune, immune, immune chemistry uh, assays. Um, after this position, I um, I wanted to become again more involved in in science. Um, working in industry is a is a is a good experience and it has a lot of perks, but I miss that. Um, uh, closeness to science, being able to contribute to the development of knowledge in in a, a shape or form that it was more meaningful. And in order to do this, is where I I apply and I accept the position as a health program specialist at um, NIH and NES, where I'm currently uh, holding the HBS uh, role. Um, and um, a little bit of, of the things that we do. So here I'm. I'm part of the um, Division of Neuroscience, and I work in the Repair and Plasticity Cluster, where we um, screen proposed projects for uh, inappropriateness of extramural grant uh, programs and NINDS, provide scientific support, and work with the program directors um, uh, to test the relevant uh, to ensure the task relevant to scientific administration of assigned grants and perform accurately and in timely fashion. So we work with program directors and the whole group in uh, the Division of Neuroscience and NDS to make um, sure that the, the grants and applications are, are, are processed and are out of the door as smoothly as, as possible. And um, this is the part of the contribution for, um, for the science and me and all my colleagues were trying to um, we're trying to put out, and um, hopefully, this uh, our contributions, together with contributions of the researchers that uh, apply for the grants, um, we're trying to make an impact in the in the health of of of, of the of the optimal of the people. Um, I don't have a lot of links uh, to to provide, but um, these are my personal links. Always. Uh, very grateful of all the people who have helped me in the in this pathway to 
uh, either advice within the careers, advice how to change the careers, and um, I'm hoping to provide um, similar help and advice to people who um, are um, have any questions for any of the positions that I've had along my career or how to get to any of those positions. So uh, without further ado, um, thanks for listening. And yeah, I'm happy to hear any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Claudio. Our next two speakers are a testament to my previous statement about NIH being a place where science thrives, dreams and aspirations are realized, and careers are nurtured. They're both NIH-funded investigators. The first is a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who has received multiple funding awards towards her dis dissertation work, one of which was an NINDS diversity supplement. It's my pleasure to introduce Anna Berglund. Thank you for that introduction and thank you to all the organizers for allowing me to participate in this. This is really an honor. Um, I hope to sort of share some of my journey and things that I have done that have brought some clarity in defining my career goals and um, sort of defining my um, intellectual uh, interest. So my journey started in Mazatlan, Sinaloa. I was born in Mexico and I lived there um, 10 years before my family decided to migrate to the US. And you know, when I think back about my childhood, it's a very different space um, than sort of what my life looks like now. Um, to give you guys an idea, I went to school um, in a convent that my mother had gone to school decades before me. Um, and so when I think back about sort of my life and how different it is, um, it is very different. And so as I mentioned, I migrated to the US when I was 10 and we moved to Southern California. Um, I remember, um, entering the school system. And, you know, we were really excited about having access to free education. That's not something that's really accessible in Mexico. Um, and, you know, I remember my mother fighting with the um, California school system to get us out of ESL classes um, because my mother didn't feel that it was really fair for us to be in ESL classes when she felt like we would not be growing in other aspects. Um, so I'm very thankful that my mother sort of pushed me um, to be challenged. Um, and, you know, that really made me sort of push me to learn English. Um, and now I'm very excited that I don't have an accent and I have done a lot of things to assimilate. Um, but, uh, you know, my father's um, job was transferred across the country. And so we moved to Western North Carolina, um, to Asheville, and that's where I did high school. And I started my what I think of my academic journey um, at a community college. And I actually stumbled upon um, pharmaceutical sciences. I went to a information session and thought, oh, I'm super excited about diseases. I like chemistry and there's this place where I could sort of go think about drugs and somebody will give me a job that became really attractive. Um, and so I decided to transfer to um, uh, North Carolina Central University because uh, they had a pharmaceutical sciences program. Um, and, you know, I sort of started finding out what I was really interested in. When I often share with people that I love organic chemistry, they just cringe. And I did, I do love organic chemistry. Um, sort of my undergraduate was really aimed at understanding screening and um, the whole pharmaceutical uh, pipeline. Um, and I was fortunate enough to do an uh, internship with the Duke Institute for Genome Sciences and Policy, where I was exposed to um, gene regulation and um, uh, genomics. Um, I had really awesome um, experience, and it really motivated me to um, apply for other fellowships, um, and I ended up going to Boston. I worked at the Broad Institute, um, and sort of interacting with people there just really opened my mind up. Um, I came in with an interest in sort of making compounds. And at the Broad, I really learned about screening and using genomic sciences to understand disease. And that was really sort of um, exciting. Um, you know, we like the stuff that we're exposed to, um, but it's really awesome when we utilize an opportunity and we get exposed to this whole other world that we had no idea existed. So I got really excited about chemical biology and using chemistry to sort of modulate um, biological events. Um, and, you know, when I had to ask a question of, do I want to go to grad school? I was sort of faced with um, a challenge. I wasn't really quite sure that I needed a PhD. None of my families um, have PhDs. And so the idea of getting a doctorate, you know, was kind of 
well, are you not going to get a job? Is that a job? How does that translate to making money and supporting my family? Um, so I wasn't sure that I could answer all of those questions. And so I decided to utilize a post -back program. And I will talk about that in my next slide. Um, and this program was a unique program because it's through um, MIT biology department, but it allowed me the opportunity to work at Novartis. And Novartis is a pharmaceutical company. And so this seemed like a great opportunity where I could kind of keep exploring my scientific interest along with kind of starting to get emerged in the pharmaceutical space. Um, I sort of um, wasn't quite sure that graduate school was for me at the time. Um, I had a lot of colleagues who were successful in um, the in like pharmaceutical industry space. And I thought that maybe that made sense for me. Um, but I learned that um, working in industry comes with certain limitations. And I think I was really excited about my curiosity in developing that. So I found myself taking a position um, back in the Chapel Hill um, Durham space. And I started working for um, Duke uh, Center for Genomic and Computational Biology. I was generating a lot of data and you know, I really wanted to learn how to um, analyze this data that I was generating. And so this really pushed me to go into grad school because I finally was able to sort of define why I wanted to go to grad school. Um, and I joined UNC and I'm currently getting a PhD in um, genetics and molecular biology. And so, you know, I think when I was thinking about what can I talk um, during this webinar, and I thought, well, I should share some of experiences that really shaped me. And I think participating in summer programs was sort of the beginning of getting excited. I was at a, so North Carolina Central University is an HBCU school. Um, they do have uh, research, but it's not as strong as other universities. And so I utilized the opportunity to go do summer programs and check out other campuses and other programs where I could sort of see myself developing. And I think through these networks, um, you know, I think that that's sort of the, the theme that you should walk away with all of these presentations is that there's really no linear path and networking and, and sort of opening your horizons will sort of lead your path. And there's really no right path um, to success. Um, and as I mentioned, I wasn't quite sure what to do after I graduated. So I did a post back program with MIT and Novartis. And I have put in some information here if you're interested um, in checking that out. Um, after I joined graduate school, I also participated in uh, UNC T32, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with what T32 is, but it's a funding mechanism, and you can have an institution that gets these awards, and so my department did have one, and I think participating really helped me to think a lot about career development and sort of what I was doing in grad school. It was also very nice to have someone kind of looking in and making sure that I was sort of uh, moving through grad school because it is a very hard journey. Um, and so being involved with this T32 program allowed me to have other mentors that sort of kept me in check and also helped me as I went through grad school. I also had a child. And so I have a three-year-old. That's not really um, uh, a lot of my colleagues and in and, and my peers aren't having children. So it was really nice to have um, sort of someone that I could check in with. And as we mentioned, um, when when I was being introduced, I'm actually a diversity supplement uh, awardee, and I would really urge anyone in the audience to really exploit these um, funding mechanisms. They are there. Um, I kind of popped this chart up because I really liked it. Um, this is the um, R01s that are associated with a diversity supplement, and they are broken down into different um, um, uh, uh, the different um, agencies. And um, I'm part of NINDS, um, and so I'm really happy to see that we're higher up on this bar. Um, but you should know that if you're a trainee, you should be training in an environment where your mentor is funded. They will most likely have R01 grants. And, you know, you should know that you can be funded. And I think diversity supplements will fund someone from beginning sort of uh, at the maybe high school or undergrad level, and you can go all the way to a junior faculty. And so it's really important to sort of know that these mechanisms are out there. And um, a lot of them get funded. For me, it was the beginning of getting involved with NINDS, and they have been an extremely supportive um, uh, just collection of people. Um, and uh, so I would really urge you to sort of look at this. Um, and, you know, another thing that I would say is uh, doing diversity enrichment programs. I have been very lucky to have gotten involved with some people that have been really um, just extremely encouraging. Um, and um, as 
was advertised I'm a D-SPAN awardee, and this is an F99 K00. And if you're wondering about this funding mechanism or wondering what funding is about, you should check out Building Up the Nerve because for real, this has told me everything I need to know about how to develop a relationship with the government and what happens after you submit a grant. I have popped up some information about this uh, fellowship, and if anybody's interested, I do want to point out that this fellowship is targeted for individuals at the end of their graduate um, training, and so if you fall into this timeline, you should totally check them out. Um, I really urge you to apply because you never know when things will be funded. And if you don't apply, you will never know whether they pick you or not. So I have put in my contact information and I'm super down to talk about this um, fellowship and how to put together a competitive application because there is an art to it, as I'm finding out. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm part of a lab that studies epilepsy. And what I do is I take brain resected tissue of individuals that have undergone epilepsy surgery. And I sequence to try to identify mutations um, to try to explain seizures. Um, and I have popped in some information about some undergrad summer programs that I think are excellent. And, you know, I want to point out the Amgen Scholars Program. It's in a lot of different um, uh, institutions, and so you should totally check them out. And also some post -back, um programs. And I'm happy to talk offline or if you guys have any questions, know that I'm available um, and super down to connect. Thank you so much, Anna. And I apologize for um, turning on my camera before. I thought the one before was your last slide. Um, I saw that you went to Asheville, North Carolina. If you, anyone you know, or your family was affected um, by uh, Helene, my apologies. And to anyone else that's online and was has been affected by um, this hurricane season, um, my heart goes out to you all. Um, so for our next speaker, um, our last speaker is also from Mexico, uh, the country that I had a pleasure of living in and experiencing the culture. They gifted us with spicy food that we heard Claudio and loves, um, chilaquiles and El Chavo del Ocho, all things that most Latinos are familiar with. He's also someone who has been able to take advantage of the funding opportunities throughout NIH, um, such as the new Innovator Award and an award from the Common Fund while at Harvard Medical School. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carlos R. Ponce. Hello, thank you all for being here and thank you for the invitation to, uh, to chat. Uh, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, where I come from. So first, let me tell you what I do now. I run a vision lab in the Department of Neurobiology uh, here at Harvard Medical School where we study vision. Uh, specifically, we use electrophysiology to study neurons, individual neurons in very different parts of the brain from the more sensory areas like primary visual cortex all the way to prefrontal cortex more recently. So the way that I, you know, I, I started studying all of this really goes back to my days growing up in a farm in Mexico. I grew up in Mexico State. Uh, it's just a couple of hours from Mexico City. I grew up in a farm. I looked at I remember spending a lot of time with the chickens and just kind of looking at the, at the one cow that we had and just kind of figuring out uh, how they behaved. And it was fascinating. I like to believe that if I had stayed in Mexico, I probably would have grown up to be a scientist. But unfortunately, um, I never got to find out because my family, you know, they were struggling financially. So my mom decided that she wanted to come to the United States. And, um, you know, when you want to come to the United States and you don't have a lot of money, uh, you can wait 20 years to get a visa or you can do the other way. Um, and we ended up doing that way. So I was 12 years old when um, my mom decided to come across. We paid a coyote and I just basically ran across the border where we landed in uh, where our cousin, we had a distant cousin in Salt Lake City, Utah, where I, end, I ended up enrolling in uh, ESL classes to learn English. Um, I really enjoyed being at that school and that, you know, it was an interesting school but because the ESL program was not exactly well integrated. And there were a few issues that I really liked, but there were some really good teachers there in ESL. And one of them noticed that I kind of had a love of animals and encouraged me to maybe apply uh, to, to try and graduate into the honors program uh, from ESL. And I did that. Um, and there I took this class that was amazing. It was basically a biology course that was a survey about all the animal, all the different phyla 
uh, that exist in in life. And I, and, you know, I always liked animals, but then I realized there was an extra dimension to the animals that I had been observing. I saw a kinship in the sense that we had actually, uh, we had a common descendant, right? We had a common ancestor and we were cousins in a way. And suddenly like to understand the relationship that I had learned about it, that I experienced as a, uh, you know, in, in as a kid and to realize that there was something more ancient to it made me say, all right, I got to study biology. This is what I'm going to do all my life. Unfortunately, I didn't have my documents. I was undocumented. Uh, and so I really wasn't able to go to college for uh, for a while, for a, you know, a few years. So I basically just did landscaping. I worked in uh, dishwashing. And who knows what might have happened. It wasn't like the best time in my life, obviously, because I knew what I wanted to do in life, but I couldn't do it. But I managed to to do jobs here and there until finally... It turned out my mom married somebody who had applied to the Immigration and Reform Control Act uh, a long time ago, and that person was able to give uh, documentation and permanent uh, residency to my mother and myself. And so I immediately jumped to the University of Utah where I could do my biology. And it was this time, at the bio, uh, you know, a couple of years after I started, that I found this beautiful article in Scientific American. Uh, a habit that I had picked up while I was still not able to go to college. And I read this article by Samir Zeki that talked about this interesting fact that I had no idea about this connection between perception and neuronal function. And this article talked about how, you know, you and I, when we looked at the world, if assuming we have intact cortex, we see like a very nice unified picture of the world. Everything is just kind of, you see movements and colors and everything's nicely meshed together. But of course, in this article, uh, uh, Dr. Zeki mentioned that people with certain damage to cortex were not able to, for example, they, they would experience achromatopsia, they would lose the ability to distinguish colors. So here's an example of a patient with achromatopsia who's drawing different kinds of fruits. And to, the, to, the, to them, the colors look pretty similar. Another person with another kind of cortical damage would be able to copy like a picture of a cathedral, but never be able to, not be able to identify. This person suffers from agnosia. And to me, that was so fascinating because then I started to realize that in, in the article that this happens because the visual brain is really, even though perception seems unified, all of this is divided into different areas. And so in the monkey, we have at least 32 different visual areas in the humans, probably more. And each area tends to have a specific allocation of neurons that can do things like form, motion, and color. And to see all of this, this is one of the early articles that I read. And I was like, okay, I want to be a biologist, but I also want to study the brain. And so finally, I was in college. I was able to apply. And I, said, I thought, well, let's just stick with it. So I applied to an MD-PhD. Um, originally, I didn't know what the difference was between MD-PhD as well. So I decided just to try both. And I did I did manage to get into, uh, into Harvard, where I decided that I could finally study this uh, brain uh, issues for the rest of my life. So I did my MD PhD here. I did my uh, a postdoc. I did a couple of years of residency. And then I finally got the opportunity to uh, a job offer at Washington University in St. Louis, an amazing uh, institution where I could start my lab. And I started my lab there. I, I Everything went really well. And then uh, Harvard reached back and, and said, hey, would you be interested in maybe uh, uh, applying for this job? So I, I did apply and, and I got a chance to move my lab back to what it felt like home. I had spent here a long time, so I'm very happy to be back and uh, help the next generation of folks. And I, that's where I study vision. So uh, just to tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing, I want to encourage you all, if you're at all interested in vision, that uh, this is the best time to be studying this. Um, so let me tell you why. Right now, we can study the brain using electrophysiology, as people have done for 70 years. But what makes things differently is the fact that we can now also use machine learning. And in machine learning, we can basically take models that know a lot about the world, about the visual world, and we can take neurons, and we can basically put them together so that we can understand how neurons are activated in the brain. So we can take these deep networks, like deep generative networks, whose job is to create random images, new images, just kind of synthetic images. You guys have seen all of this in social media, but we can connect it now to the, to the brain in such a way that we can have generators in machine learning, have a conversation, a dialogue with neurons. They'll create images, 
the neurons respond to them. And then based on those responses, we can give through an evolutionary algorithm more inputs to the generator so that it changes the image in a way that activates the neuron and solve the problems that we've been trying to do for 70 years in the field. And so here, for example, is, is one neuron that we can be activated strongly in the, in the y-axis. I'm showing you the responses of the neuron over time, which is about 20, 20 minutes. That's the generation. And in black is the responses to the synthetic images and in green, some reference images. And what seems to be fascinating to us is the fact that the images that evolve, the images that kind of come out of the neurons driven by the neurons in the monkey's brain tend to have local features very common to what we see in the world but they're not objects. So that kind of tells us that neurons have a unique vocabulary of their own and machine learning is helping us understand what this vocabulary is. So that's all I really wanted to tell you guys for now. I'm happy to answer questions. I did want to say if you are interested um, in this kind of work or any work happening in the Boston area, I have a, a, just a link here in my, in my website uh, with a lot of programs for both undergraduate and um, um, in high school students that uh, would allow them to come for the summer. Anna's advice earlier is spot on to come and to uh, spend time on campus and to just you know learn everything that you can, be exposed to science as much as possible, really does open up a lot of opportunities. Uh, and I can't recommend Boston enough, just the density of intellectual opportunities here is uh, lovely uh, and, and you know, I, I strongly recommend it. So um, thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. If you can, you can send me emails as well, whatever you prefer. Thank you so much, um, Carlos. Um, everyone can turn their cameras on. I know that um, we went over time um, and I know that most of the questions that came in have been um, mostly addressed. They were related to everyone's um, career path, how you got um, where you are today, um, advice on um, funding, and as well as advice on careers just taking twists and turns. Um, and I also see Heidi, uh, everyone that helped with answering the Q&As, thank you so much. Um, is there anything in particular that we missed that someone wants to ask any of our panelists? There's a lot of thank you guys. I don't know if you all could see them, but um, Anna, is there anything that you see that um, that I may have missed that um, should be addressed or anybody else? No, I don't see anything. Thank you all so much for, for taking this time to present your stories. Um, I see a, a, one question came in um, potentially if you want to address it. Otherwise, we can send all these resources. We'll share the slides and the recording afterwards as well. So if you have any other questions, we'll, we'll also share the contacts of our speakers. Yeah, um, and again, thank you for shouting out um, the um, building up the nerve. Someone dropped the link to that um, as well. And I did see someone put um, MD versus MD, PhD pros and cons. And access to the recording will be shared. Anna will, um, once everything's been um, compiled, um, you will not only get the slides, but um, you'll get all the contact info as well. Does anyone want to tackle that MD, uh, MD PhD um, question? I can make a comment. I, I just answer on the on the chat as well. I think it depends on the type of research of the collaborators. I do a very clinical work uh, and I have a PhD. Still, I collaborate with a lot of MDs. So I think uh, Carlos can say from the other side in an MD PhD, right? You have access to different information. It, the training is much, much longer if you do an MD PhD. Um, there are a lot of MDs working with us. They don't have the, the research experience if, than you, you will have if you do an MD, PhD, uh, but uh, you can uh, do research as well. But I let Carlos that have the experience as the dual. No, I agree with Sylvina. It gives you 
it depends on what you want to do. I suppose I could give you my experience just quickly. I, uh, although I do have an MD PhD, I focus exclusively in research. I started an MD PhD because I didn't quite know what it was like to be a doctor or to be a PhD only. And it does, uh, and so I decided in a way to explore, and that's something that I do want to emphasize, the US educational system does allow you to explore. You should not be ashamed to explore and take your time and switch careers and, and, and all of that. Sometimes it's the only way that we really learn and we find ourselves is to do that exploration. I think both are very enjoyable. The medical work allows you to have very practical uh, applications of your day. You know that you've achieved something that means something to somebody, and that's an important thing. Um, on the other hand, your time is a little less your own. And you're driven by what a lot of people are doing, by the structure of the hospital. It's teamwork. In research, you get to get deep. You get to really focus on very specific problems for a long time. And your day is your own. You're driving your own kind of business. And you have that power and that ability uh, to get deep. Uh, you know, the payoff to society may take longer, but the knowledge is, is there and you, you, you get it fast. And ultimately for me, it came down to a, a function of personality. I am a deep introvert. And I realized that I was very happy just being able to uh, focus and run my lab with a small group of people and hopefully uh, have some of our applications help society in a different way. But it's something that you gotta discover yourself. Those were both great answers. Thank you all so, so much. Um, again, everyone, the panelists, thank you all very much um, for making this um, a very enjoyable session. Everyone that um, stayed on to listen, thank you all so, so much. Anna, anything you wanna say to close out? Yes, thank you again. Um, I'll, again, we'll be in touch uh, with more resources and the recording. And then please join us and stay connected for next month. We're going to be uh, featuring Natives in Neuro, which is a new affinity group uh, in neuroscience. So uh, we'll see you next time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you again. Bye.